Good morning. Welcome to Harry Edwards Healing Sanctuary. My name's Gary. Just want to wait for a few more people to join us. It's a bit of a misty morning today. But I'm always fond of telling people that the sanctuary always looks Always looks good at any any time of the year, in any weather. So, if I turn towards the view now. It still looks quite dramatic. Cherry trees are looking a bit sorry for themselves, but <laughs> recover. Let's go through here. And the wall there, the hedge above it, on the other side of that wall, that's the rose garden. But I'm not going up there just today. I'm going to head through the woods. The cherry tree walk sign. Lovely to the birds. This is the back entrance to the sanctuary. And this room here is now used for Bluebell's Cancer Support Group, the Harry Edwards College, also spend time here. And it's also a library with spiritual books. But in Harry Edwards' day, it wasn't used for any of those things. At the top of this room, of course, you've got the ceiling. And above the ceiling, there's the healing office where all the letters are received and the emails before they're passed to healers to be read. But in Harry Edwards' day, that ceiling wasn't there, there was no healing office. And this was used as a badminton court, 
or for amateur dramatics. And this used to be, um, up to about 10 years ago, the healing reception office. This was where you would always come if you were waiting to see a healer. This is one more of Felicity's paintings up there. Just going through here. And this is the this is the chapel, sometimes referred to as the old sanctuary. These are candles, the ever burning light. And that lovely picture of Harry Edwards for inspiration. I'm sorry, lost Wi Fi just then. Uh, then there's the bust of Harry. And the table that contains the distant healing folder. Moving along to a cast of his hands. And these sketches of Harry Edwards guides, Louis Pasteur, and Lord Lister. If I come back to here, we'll start the healing minutes. We give thanks that we are gathered here today. We ask that this place be filled with love, light, friendship, and healing energies. Surround us in protection as we open our hearts and expand our consciousness to allow the flow of love and healing to come through us. As your crown chakra opens, you feel or imagine a column of pure white light filling your body. Then feel the balance and harmony within your body as the earth energy rises up through the soles of your feet and your base chakra. You feel your connection to the universal source of pure, unconditional love balanced by the nurturing, protective love of Mother Earth. Harry Edwards' prayer. May I be thankful for the blessings I already have. Grant me relief from pain and sickness, protect me from all ills, and grant me good health in the days to come. Remove all causes of imperfection, and bring your healing ministers close to me, that I may be conscious of their strength in all times of need. Grant me confidence to overcome my fears and not to anticipate harm. Teach me how to live rightly in your sight, to do only that which is right and true. I pray the good guidance and right influencing will inspire all your peoples to be as brothers, one to the other, and that peace shall endure for all time. It's something to think about, those words, peace shall endure for all time. At this time of the year, especially with Tomorrow being Remembrance Day. So, as we're at the part of the healing minute, 
we'll ask you to join me in a minute's silence where we can set up healing to everybody who that we know who needs healing at this time. And I'll ask you, as always, to remember the animal kingdom. But for today, could I ask you also to remember those people who gave so much during the wars. Thanks and blessings for your help here today and to our friends in spirit. I want to read a story this morning. It's called Letting Go. It's from a book I read from. From Answered Prayers. And this story is by Lady Kerry Flanagan. I can't do this anymore, I told the social worker. I'd like you to find another placement for the girls. By the end of the month, I'm sorry. As I hung up the phone, I questioned if I had done the right thing. How would another move affect them? Would they feel abandoned? Would the next home be a safe place? It had been one year since my husband and I and our two children, ages eight and ten, decided to become a foster family. During the training, we had high hopes that we would have a positive impact on the lives of the abused, hurt children who would come through our home. We figured my background in education would be an asset. We heard the social workers talk about the challenges we might face, but those thoughts were overshadowed by our excitement. Then the call came. Kerry, we're looking for a home for two sisters, five-year-old Paula and two-year-old Casey, said the social worker. The older girl has some developmental problems as a result of a brain injury from abuse. The social worker went on to explain that the girls had a newborn sister and older brother who had already been placed in two different homes. Social services would speed up our final paperwork if we agreed to take the girls. We did. When they arrived, their big brown eyes were filled with anxiety and uncertainty. My children showed our guests their new room where we put a stuffed animal, toothbrush and a book on each bed. The first few days went well, but it wasn't long before our calm household turned upside down. Because of their bad experiences around men, the girls cowered around my husband. Casey began hissing, biting and crying at bedtime and screaming in the car. Paula's special needs were more severe than we originally thought. She functioned more at a three-year-old level and had problems with her balance and coordination. Glimpses of hope broke through after a few weeks 
when I signed Paula up for special education kindergarten class. We got both girls eye exams and glasses. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Katie's outbursts virtually disappeared. And we watched as Casey began talking more and showing more independence. And she also she could count to ten. Paula learned to ride a bike, tie her shoes and zip her coat. I enjoyed the good moments, but questioned our good intentions as we watched our own children struggle with this new challenge. The girls followed my daughter around, pestering her with questions and not allowing her a moment of peace. My son, a quiet, mellow boy by nature, had a hard time with the constant chatter and listening to the girls fight. Paula antagonised him until he couldn't take being around her and he hid away in his room. My two kids tried to be good sports, but they were tired of being dragged around in the car for the girls' weekly visits with their mum or therapists. I knew Paula and Casey needed love, structure and understanding, but my stress levels were on overdrive. Their need for constant supervision made it difficult for me to cook dinner, clean or care for my family. My relationship with my husband started feeling strained. I felt my life falling apart around me. My heart broke when my son came to me one day in tears. I want the girls to go. Girls to go. I don't want to do foster care anymore. I was torn. I wanted things to go back to the way they were. But the intense internal conflict paralysed me and I couldn't think straight. Good mums don't give up on their kids. Good mums don't abandon their children. Good mums hang in there. I prayed, God, please help me. Show me what I'm supposed to do. The response that kept popping into my head was, it's time to let go. I didn't understand what I was supposed to let go of, the exhaustion, the fear, the anxiety. I finally confided in a friend and told her I felt like a horrible mother. She told me, Kerry, it's not your fault the girls are in foster care. You didn't put them there. It's okay to let go. It's okay to tell the social worker you can't do this anymore. Her words echoed in my head for days. I struggled with what to do. Do I continue to subject my kids to this chaos? Do I put my two children at risk in order to help these other two? The idea of having to choose devastated me and all I wanted to do was run away. But I knew something had to be done. Exhausted, I called Paula and Katie's caseworker. Social services moved faster than I expected and within a week they had a new placement of the girls in another city. The day we brought them to their new home, we put on happy faces for the girls' sake, gave them scrapbooks of their time with us, hugged them and told them how much we enjoyed having them with us. And within minutes, they were gone. Time went on and life settled down. Everyone's stress level dropped the house was quieter and we got back to our family routine. But for me, a small piece of guilt still hung on. Because of privacy laws regarding children in foster care, we had no more contact with the girls and could not get any more information. People would ask, where are Casey and Paula? And I would have to explain to them that we couldn't do it anymore and the guilt clung tighter. I thought of them often, and though I didn't miss the chaos, I did miss Katie's giggle and Paula's singing. I wondered if they were back with their mum or in another foster home. I prayed over and over, please God let me know if they are safe and happy. Let me know I did the right thing. Four years passed and I was at the local county fair with a friend and my family. We were visiting the area that housed the chickens and I watched a little girl clean out one of the cages. When she turned around I knew in an instant it was Paula. I quickly scanned the room and sure enough, Casey was there too. My heart raced. I grabbed my friend's arm. Look, there's Paula and Casey. You should go say hello, she said. Oh, they won't remember me. It's been too long, I said. I see Mary, the foster mum, who used to take care of, of their baby sister. She's over there, I pointed. Well, let's go talk to her then. My friend insisted. Well, I'm not sure. What if my friend grabbed my arm and led me over to Mary? Kerry used to be Paula and Katie's foster mum, she said. Mary looked at me, I thought you looked familiar. 
How are they? I asked. She explained that the girls were in two more foster homes before finally ending up with her. The courts eventually terminated their biological mum's rights and all four of the kids were put up for adoption. Mary and her husband already had the youngest of the siblings and decided to adopt all four of the kids so they could grow up together. Each of the kids got new names along with their new family. They loved living on their big property with the animals. Mary homeschooled the kids so they were all getting the attention they needed. They're doing really well, Mary beamed. Thank you, I said, holding back tears. I needed to hear that. I never did talk to Paula and Katie, but I didn't need to. I got the answer I had been praying for. I knew they were safe and happy. The guilt I had carried for so many years was lifted. My purpose in their life was clear. I was to provide them with a nurturing home, while God prepared them for their forever family. Thank you. That's from Kerry Flanagan. That's a lovely story. It's showing the sanctuary symbol there, the golden cross, surrounded by the golden circle. And lastly, I'd like to read a short story. It's from Harry Edwards' book, 30 Years of Spiritual Healer, which is now out of print. It's a pity, really, because it's a, a lovely book, talking not so much as healing instruction, it's more of his experiences. And he's talking about a letter that he's received here. Mrs. Frieda Inglefield of Leamington Spa sent me, a, sent me a letter telling of the different ways in which the healing powers helped her son, daughter and herself over a period of time. Here it is. What a remarkable improvement. I would never have believed it possible. When the eye specialist spoke those cheering words to my daughter, my heart lifted. This was the second time a medical specialist had given such a verdict on one of my children. The first time it concerned my son. He was born with a valvular disease, but as the years went by, with spiritual healing, a rare change had taken place in him. His heart muscles had grown strong enough for the heart to work normally. And now my daughter, who had very poor eyesight following operations for cataract, was being told her eyes were getting stronger, that she now needed only fine lenses. Could two such outstanding health improvements in one family be coincidence? I don't think so. I feel convinced it was through the powers of spiritual healer Harry Edwards that my children were put on the road to health, for their recovery began only from the time I first wrote to him. Though he has never met my son and daughter, Mr Edwards prayed for them constantly, concentrating his healing powers upon them, and the miracle occurred. <laughs> How wonderful to hear the stories. Walk round the chapel while I'm here. And to the hands of healing encompass the world. Going back, it's a lovely symbol. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. I hope that you will all enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>